All right, so I think we are now live once again. So hello, everyone. Welcome back to another edition of Quarantine Thermo. Uh, I think this is uh, talk number 35. So really delighted that we're, we're still um, going. Um, this is actually going to be the last talk that I'm going to be presenting before we take a break. Um, but uh, so I'm very happy to be able to introduce um, Dr. Adam Stokes of the University of Manchester. Um, so Adam is uh, an expert in quantum optics. He's been doing some really interesting work on the kind of foundations of the subject uh, and how sort of the importance of, of gauge relativity and, and ambiguities for, for kind of quantum field theory, quantum thermodynamics. Um, and so he'll be telling us about that uh, today. Um, before I hand over to Adam, um, I'll just do what I always do, which is basically just uh, describe the format. So in case we have any new viewers, basically Adam's going to give his talk uninterrupted for however long he wants, and then we'll have questions and answers at the end of the talk. So if you have any questions, um, you can just write them in the YouTube chat window, uh, either during the talk or at the end, and I'll relay them to Adam um, and he can answer them for you uh, at the end of the talk. Um, but please just make sure that your name is clear um, when you write your, your question, just so I know who's, who's asking. Um, so uh, yeah, so then I'll, that's basically it. So I'll hand over to you, Adam, you can, uh, you can take it away. Okay, thanks very much, Mark. Um, yeah, hello everyone, my name is Adam. Uh, so I suppose the first thing to say is uh, thanks very much for having me. It's a privilege to talk at this, uh, this event, which has been really good in these sort of weird circumstances. So yeah, I'm really glad to have the opportunity. Uh, so my talk is about this idea of subsystem gauge relativity um, um, and what that means is, is going to be the first part of the talk. So I've gone for this format where I divide the talk into two parts. First part, I'm going to introduce this notion of subsystem gauge relativity and explain what it means and, and why I think it's important. And then in the second part, I'm going to sort of exemplify that importance or exemplify its utility in uh, in the context of, of the thermodynamic phases of cavity QED systems. So this is a sort of a hotly debated topic that has these sort of apparent paradoxes that have been uh, that have been discussed to and fro for, for many decades. And we can use this subsystem gauge relativity idea to sort of resolve these uh, paradoxes. So that's the format, the concept, and then and then an application, if you like. Um, so I thought it would be good to start right at the beginning with the, the, the concept of uh, or, or the, the notion of electric charge, which is obviously very fundamental. Um, so before I do even that, though, I, I'll just very quickly recap some um, basic elements of vector calculus. So any three vector field over, over space or space time can be decomposed uniquely in a transverse and longitudinal parts. And the transverse part is divergenceless, and the longitudinal part is curl free. Uh, and this is a unique decomposition. It turns out it's going to be really useful for, for what we want to discuss. Uh, so, electric charge is defined by this equation here, one of Maxwell's equations, uh, the Gauss law, and it specifies uniquely the electric field, which we define as being uh, a vector field attribution of, of properties to points in space and time that diverge radially outward from from a distribution of charge in, in space and time. Uh, and charge is sort of enigmatic. I mean, it's quantized, but we, we don't really know why. Um, uh, well, we could explain that if there were magnetic charges, but they don't seem to exist. So it's, it's a bit of a mystery why electric charge is quantized. It's also conserved. Actually, if we take the temporal derivative of this equation, then we get nothing but the, the continuity equation for electric charge using the other Maxwell equations. Uh, and since it's conserved, it has an associated symmetry. But unlike the other fundamental conserved quantities that we know about, so energy and momentum and angular momentum and those things, the symmetry isn't isn't associated with space time. It's it's a different kind of symmetry, so it's gauged symmetry. Uh, and and the important thing about this equation is that it's a constraint, so it's not dynamical. It's telling us that certain degrees of freedom that we want to call electromagnetic are equal. They're the same thing as certain degrees of freedom that we want to call material or charge like. And this is what we can understand a gauge theory as being a theory with constraints. And the fact that we have such a constraint means that there's some there's some redundancy in our in our description. And the redundancy becomes apparent when we express the theory in terms of auxiliary quantities. So in particular, a vector potential, which I've written over here. 
And the transverse part of the vector potential, so the part that's divergence free, is, is unique. That's the same in every gauge. Um, but what we're free to choose is the longitudinal part of the vector potential. And since the curl of gradient is identically zero, we can always specify a longitudinal field as a function of a scalar function, uh, a gradient of a scalar function. Uh, and this is an extremely general freedom. Uh, and so myself and, and Ersin Nazir, who I've been doing this work with recently, we've, we've been looking into the potential implications of this freedom for um, light matter physics and, and quantum electrodynamics in, in sort of beyond the conventional regimes, by which I mean beyond the regimes of sort of weak Markovian resonant interactions. And we think that there could be very sort of broad and important implications of this freedom uh, for those for those regimes. Uh, but it's a, it's a really general freedom. Uh, in fact, it's a bit overwhelmingly general. It's a bit too general. We want we want some way of crunching this down a bit so that we can get a simple sort of way of, of, of exploring what the implications of this might be. And one way we could do that is to fix this function chi as, as some known function of space time. And I won't I won't say what that function is because it's not really important, but we can multiply that function by a parameter alpha. Since we're free to choose this longitudinal field, we're certainly free to do that. But what it means is we get a parameterization of the gauge freedom of the theory. It's encoded into just this really simple single real parameter alpha, and that specifies our vector potential. So then we can proceed to construct the, the quantum Hamiltonian description of, of our electromagnetic system with some charges and, and a quantized electromagnetic field. And using this technique of parameterizing the gauge freedom, we can uh, include as special cases the most commonly chosen gauges of, of quantum electrodynamics. So these are the Coulomb gauge, which we'll, we can specify by alpha equals zero, and the multipolar gauge, which we can specify by alpha equals one. More generally, we can interpolate between these using our parameter alpha. So the question is, how, how do these formulations of quantum electrodynamics in different gauges differ uh, to each other? Uh, well, in quantum theory, we decompose a system using the tensor product. So this really comes from probabilistic uh, considerations. The, the tensor product extends the inner product in the way that we would expect in order that the probabilities associated with the independent subsystems are the probabilities for independent events. So this is a sort of a probabilistic postulate of quantum theory, the extension of composites using the tensor product. And in quantum theory, this tensor product in quantum electrodynamics, this tensor product is necessarily going to be induced by canonical operators. In other words, uh, what we define to be our atom, if we imagine an atom inside of a, an electromagnetic environment, what we define to be our atom as a quantum subsystem, so matter as a quantum subsystem, is, is given by the canonical operators. Uh, and similarly, the electromagnetic environment is, is defined by its canonical operators. And these R and P alpha operators are, are operators that act only within the, the matter part of the Hilbert space, um, which I've labeled with an M. And these uh, Maxwell canonical operators act only within the, the photonic part of the Hilbert space, which I've labeled with C, if we imagine this box is a cavity. Um, and what differs between gauges, where we've encoded this gauge freedom into this function, when we go through the, the constrained quantization procedure, Dirac originally laid out in the 60s, I mean, it's an arduous task and it's definitely non-trivial, but out the other end, we we arrive at a, at a Hamiltonian theory, which is unconstrained. So all of the constraints have been imposed, the Gauss law and a gauge facing constraint. And the way that gauge freedom manifests within that freedom is, is a canonical freedom. So a freedom to choose among different canonical, um, in particular canonical momenta. So when we choose use this technique of encoding the gauge freedom into just a single real parameter, we find that the canonical momentum are labeled by this parameter. And in, in a gauge alpha, the material canonical momentum um, is this mechanical momentum plus a weighted uh, contribution of the momentum associated with the longitudinal electric field. So this P long is the momentum that's generated by the longitudinal electric field. And in the gauge alpha, this is weighted by a factor of one minus alpha. Similarly, the Maxwell canonical momentum is this transverse electric field uh, plus an alpha weighted contribution from this transverse polarization field. And at any point outside of the atom, so anywhere where the field can be measured, this transverse polarization equals, again, the longitudinal electric degrees of freedom, which are constrained and which implied the existence of, of gauge freedom. So in other words, what this alpha is doing is telling us how we're sharing out these constrained degrees of freedom between the light matter quantum subsystems. 
Um, if I choose the Coulomb gauge, alpha equals zero, we see that matter is defined as being this mechanical object plus um, the contributions of the, of the electrostatic field that's permanently tied to that bare atom. Uh, and, in, and meanwhile, the, the, the electromagnetic quantum subsystem is, is completely um, free of any longitudinal contribution. So for alpha equals zero, um, in the Coulomb gauge, the light quantum subsystem is defined only in terms of the transverse electric field. So the Coulomb gauge defines matter as a quantum subsystem as something that includes all of these longitudinal electric degrees of freedom. The Coulomb gauge says that these constrained degrees of freedom are being put inside of matter and none of them are inside light. In the multipolar gauge, which is the other commonly chosen gauge in, in, in quantum electrodynamics, it's exactly the other way around. So if we choose alpha equals one, the canonical momentum is just a bare mechanical momentum, um, whereas the Maxwell canonical momentum is the transverse electric field plus the longitudinal electric field, so the full electric field. So for alpha equals one, these constrained degrees of freedom are being put entirely within the light subsystem, and the matter subsystem is this purely bare mechanical um, object. And so what's important to recognize is that Every one of these definitions of light and matter is a gauge invariant definition. This is a gauge invariant observable, this mechanical momentum, as is the longitudinal um, momentum of the, of the field. Uh, and a linear combination of gauge invariant observables is a gauge invariant observable. But for each different alpha, we get a different gauge invariant observable. Uh, it's the same for Maxwell canonical momentum. In other words, for every, every different gauge is giving us a different gauge invariant definition of what matter and light are as quantum subsystems. Now this isn't gauge non-invariant. This is what this actually is, is every, every one of these definitions is gauge invariant. So what this is, is a form of relativity. This is what we mean by saying that, that the quantum subsystems can only be defined relative to the choice of gauge. And so to really sort of uh, motivate that terminology and explain what that means, I think a really useful analogy is, a, is an analogy with special relativity. So a, a theory which we know has uh, inherent relativity due to its linear structure. So we know that we can specify the laws of physics uh, in any inertial frame. So the postulate of special relativity that states that is, is the postulate of Lorentz invariance. The laws of physics are going to be the same in every inertial frame. Uh, and so space-time is a vector space. It has an inner product, the Minkowski inner product, or an indefinite inner product. Uh, inner product. And it has a symmetry group, so that's the Lorentz group. And the Lorentz transformations are things that take us between different inertial frames of space-time. And every inertial frame has its decomposition into time and space. Uh, but the Lorentz transformation in transforming between frames mixes up the definitions of time and space. So this is, uh, this is telling us that time and space are relative concepts. They can only be defined relative to an inertial frame in, in space-time. This, of course, isn't the same thing as non-invariance. Of course, uh, special relativity is Lorentz invariant and the fact that space and time are relative concepts doesn't contradict that. Uh, the relativity of space and time and Lorentz invariance are both fundamental features of uh, special relativity that are absolutely compatible. Um, and it's, it's essentially exactly the same situation in QED. We have a vector space, not space time, we have a Hilbert space of states. We have an inner product, but rather than the Minkowski inner product, it's a Hermitian positive definite inner product. It has a symmetry group, but rather than the Lorentz group, it's the unitary group. And we label different gauge frames of the Hilbert space by, by our gauge parameter alpha. And each different uh, gauge frame has a different partition of, of, of the overall system in a light and matter subsystem. So the unitary gauge fixing transformations transform between these different gauge, fix, uh, gauge frames of the Hilbert space. And in so doing, just like the Lorentz transformations mix up space and time, they mix up the definitions of light and matter. So, that means that light and matter can only be defined relative to a, a gauge frame in the Hilbert space. Of course, this is not at all incompatible with gauge invariance. We have this uh, condition, of, this postulate of gauge invariance that the physical predictions should be the same in every gauge frame, in the same way that the physical prediction should be the same in every inertial frame, as in the laws of physics should be the same in every inertial frame. So gauge invariance here is analogous to Lorentz invariance over here. Um, the relativity of light and matter uh, the gauge relativity of light and matter is directly analogous to the relativity of space and time over here. So it's important not to conflate relativity with non-invariance. Um, the, the theory is fundamentally gauge invariant, but light and matter are inherently relative concepts. They can only be defined physically relative to, to a gauge frame in Hilbert space. Okay, so that's that's what we mean by, by subsystem gauge relativity. Um, each different gauge is giving us a different physical 
definition of light and matter. Every definition is Gaussian variant, but every definition is different. Um, okay, so, well, when is this going to be important? Okay, so subsystems are gauge relative, but when when is that actually going to be important? For example, we know full well that in special relativity, we can often ignore completely the relativity of space and time. We can perform a non-relativistic approximation and we extract Galilean relativity from special relativity. And in Newtonian physics or Galilean relativity, space and time are absolute, they're the same in every inertial frame, right? So we are able to ignore completely the relative nature of space and time in, in the non-relativistic approximation. Is there an equivalent regime of quantum electrodynamics in which we can completely ignore the gauge relativity of subsystems? Uh, and it turns out there is, and uh, in fact, it turns out that it's nothing but the conventional regime of, of weak Markovian resonant interactions. Actually, we can give a very precise meaning to what the gauge non-relativistic regime is. Uh, and um, the easiest way to do that is probably in the context first of, of scattering theory. So if we're a quantum field theorist, all our predictions come from the, the, the quantum field theoretic S matrix. And what that is, is we partition the Hamiltonian in whatever gauge we choose, uh, alpha, into interacting in three parts. And the S-matrix provides us with the probability amplitudes for processes that connect eigenstates of this free part. So if we start in some initial eigenstate of, of H0 um, with some number of photons and some number of material excitations, again, we can think of an example of this atom in a field as a, as a physical picture. We adiabatically switch on the interaction over an infinite amount of time, and then we switch it off adiabatically over an infinite amount of time. And then we ask, what is the probability that this evolved state is in some other eigenstate of H0? So in other words, the, the, the S matrix gives us the probability amplitude for processes uh, between bare eigenstates of H0 over infinite times in which the interaction is switched on and off adiabatically. Now the S matrix has this, this sort of remarkable property, which is that independent of whatever Hamiltonian I use, um, whatever gauge I choose, I'll always get the same S matrix element for a given process. Now, at first glance, that might sound quite unremarkable. It might sound like all I'm telling you then is that the S matrix is a gauge invariant, which of course you would expect as a physical prediction, but actually it's much more than that. When we have a, a unitary transformation on the Hilbert space, we expect to get the same matrix elements um, for, as, a, as a physical prediction when we transform both the operator and the vectors that the operator that represents the observable we're interested in and the vectors that represent the states that we're interested in. So we have to transform both the operators and the states for matrix elements to be invariant, and then we can use the unitarity of our transformation. But the S matrix has this remarkable property that we can use different Hamiltonians that are all unitarily related by a gauge transformation. And we don't have to bother changing the eigenstates. We can use the same eigenstates of H0 in every gauge, and we will always get the same result. So this is not at all actually what we expect. This is a quite unique and remarkable um, property of the S matrix. Um, and the reason it holds is because the interaction is switched off uh, over an infinite amount of time adiabatically. So at the beginning and the end of the process, the eigenstates involved are in fact eigenstates of the full Hamiltonian, which are of course unique. Otherwise, um, this H0 operator represents altogether different uh, physical observable in every different gauge. The gauge transformation doesn't commute with H0. So if we keep this the same in every gauge, then it's telling us that this is a different observable in each different gauge. And that's with that we already know. We know that the material and photonic excitations um, represent different physical excitations in each different gauge because they, they, they different each different gauge just defines light and matter differently. But the S matrix has this remarkable property that we can completely ignore that fact. We can ignore the fact that the eigenstates of H0 are different physical states in each different gauge. We can pretend that they're the same physical state and we can just use the same state in conjunction with any Hamiltonian and always get the same prediction. Uh, so the crucial property of the S matrix is that it, it, it describes bare energy conserving processes, so so-called real processes to conserve H0. And this, this, this conservation of this free part is going to be crucial in, in, in defining what we mean by the gauge non-relativistic regime. So the regime in which we can completely ignore the relativity of the subsystems. Uh, and so to exemplify this uh, outside of the context of scattering theory, in, a, in maybe a more familiar 
uh, setting, we can consider the derivation of the, of the master equation for this atomic system inside its electromagnetic environment. So we're looking to, to provide a reduced description of this atom. Now, if we trace out the photonic degrees of freedom, uh, we're left with a, a reduced description of, of, of the atomic system uh, as defined relative to the gauge alpha. And this is a different physical definition for every different value of alpha. So we're getting a completely different reduced description of a different physical system for every different gauge that we trace the, the photonic degrees of freedom out in. Now that's not gauge non invariance, that's, that's, a, uh, that's a product of gauge, non -rel uh, of gauge relativity. It's telling us that the atom is a different physical thing in every different gauge. So when we trace out the photons and we're left only with the atom, we're left with a description of something physically different for every different possible definition of, 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 of atom that we can make. Uh, but under what conditions can we ignore that fact? Can we pretend like this atom is really a unique thing and that every gauge finds it in the same way? Well, it turns out that the approximations that we need are exactly the conventional approximations that define the quantum optics par paradigm, really, the weak coupling Markovian approximations. Um, and we can use whatever our favorite textbook is for, for deriving the, the quantum optical master equation. So the, Probably the, the familiar one is this really good handbook of open quantum systems. Brian Patriccioni goes through the, the the derivation. As I count it, there are five approximations. So the first one is this board approximation that the system and environment are uncorrelated over the time scales. Then the second order perturbation theory, so the, the coupling's weak. Markovian approximation, so that the system's memoryless. I mean, uh, we approximate the, the, the density matrix as, as local in time for all preceding times. We extend the integration limit to of the integrated von Neumann equation to infinity, uh, which already we can see is mimicking the infinite time um, the infinite time component of the definition of the S matrix. Uh, and any any processes that are left at this stage, which are still um, bare energy non-conserving, any description of just such processes that is left are then just finally and, and perhaps a little crudely just bluntly ignored in this secular approximation. And so that gets rid finally of any of any remaining energy non-conserving processes. And the, the, the result of this derivation is that we get a reduced description that despite should despite the fact that it should refer to altogether different physical subsystems for each different value of alpha, um, actually is completely independent of, of what gauge we derive it in. So it's completely independent of the fact that in reality, in truth, the, the, the matter subsystem is something physically different in every different gauge. In other words, this is the gauge non-relativistic regime in which we can ignore the fact that the subsystems are relative and we can pretend that this material subsystem is something that's unique. The process is described by this Lindblad master equation um, where the Lindblad operators are just the raising and lowering operators for the atom and these decay rates are just the spontaneous emission rates. So this is zero temperature. Uh, it's, it's easily extended to finite temperature. Uh, the processes described by this are just the same processes described by the S matrix. The spontaneous emission rate is a first order, order S matrix element, which is necessarily gauge non-relative. Uh, the lamp shift inside the shifted uh, atomic or dipolar Hamiltonian is also uh, an on-energy shell T matrix element. So it's an S matrix element, which is also gauge invariant. In other words, these approximations, which define the optics paradigm, are exactly those approximations we need in order that the, we're inside the gauge non-relativistic regime. We can pretend that the quantum subsystems are ostensibly unique and that they're, they're the same according to every gauge. The upshot is that outside of this regime, whenever any of these approximations aren't justified, then the gauge relativity of the quantum subsystems is something that we're not going to be able to ignore. Um, the subsystems are fundamentally gauge relative, and it's only because of the non-relativistic approximations that we can sometimes ignore that fact. So we're sort of interested in what the implications of, of, of this gauge relativity is outside of the, these regimes. Um, so, well, the, the question then is, what if the subsystems are, are gauge relative, what's the most relevant definition um, to choose for, for a subsystem in any given situation? So again, we can bear in mind as a sort of picture, this idea of an atom inside of an electromagnetic field. And every different gauge gives us a different definition of what this atom is and what this field is. And so what we want to know is what, what definition should we employ in any given situation? So mostly when you, you ask people, I think the consensus is, well, if we if we phrase this in, in, the, in the context of sort of an open system, so we have an, a system and, and, and an environment, what, we, what we're asking is what, what is a system? 
Um, and the most the most common answer that you get is it's it's whatever we measure. Uh, and this is this seems quite reasonable to adopt an operational definition of what constitutes system. It's not especially helpful though. I mean, it's a bit of a platitude. Um, we've just replaced one question, which is what is a system with another question, and that is what do we measure? Um, and so we can, to make progress, start to ask, well, what are the generic features of a measurement or, or what are the generic features of, of an instance in which we are probing the system with, with some apparatus or a measurement or addressing or controlling the system? And we can probably say that, that a measurement is, is guaranteed to have some finite ex extent in, in space time. We're not going to measure the whole universe and we're also not going to measure a single point. It's somewhere in between. Um, and what varied, one of the things that we know it varied between gauges is in how they, they um, define the atom as being uh, including or excluding the electrostatic field that's permanently tied to it. So in the multipolar gauge, we have this bare atom represented just by this, this black atom here in, in the middle of the picture. But in the Coulomb gauge, that bare atom is it added to that is the electrostatic field that's always tied to it. So this drops off fairly rapidly. Um, so it's fairly well localized. It, for a dipole, it'll drop off like the distance cubed. So it's polynomial decay, but it's fairly rapid. So the Coulomb gauge atom is still fairly localized, um, but it's obviously less localized than the bare multipolar gauge atom. Uh, more generally, we can tune with our choice of parameter alpha the extent to which this electrostatic field that's permanently tied to the bare atom is included inside its definition. And that's what the gauge is doing. So the gauge is controlling are the balance between localization and electrostatic dressing in defining what it is that we mean by matter or by atom. So if we say now that we can probe with a measurement a given region of space, then the most op operationally relevant definition of what our system is, is generally going to be dependent on what that, that, that range in space that the measurement uh, can access is. Uh, so there's no one gauge that is always going to give us the most the correct or relevant definition of what system is. That's something that's going to depend on the measure the measurements we can perform. Uh, of course, in gauge non-relativistic regimes, we can ignore that completely. So we can understand gauge non-relativistic regimes as as a regime where we don't have to measure uh, worry about what what measurements it is that we're actually intending to perform in describing our system and our environment, and we can view it in isolation because every definition of system is essentially the same. But outside of those regimes, this is an important question. And the answer to what the most operationally relevant definition of system and environment are is generally going to depend on the measurements we can perform. And actually, the, the situation is very nuanced. It's very subtle. Um, so far, we've restricted our attention to this simple, um, this simple framework in which we've parameterized the gauge freedom using this single real parameter. But as I noted at the start, actually, this freedom is really, really general. In fact, we can we can engineer essentially any spectral density that we want for the interaction between the system and the environment by changing nothing but the gauge. It's an extremely general freedom. Uh, and each different spectral density is telling us that we have a different um, matter and light system. So for example, in the Coulomb gauge, the spectral density is ohmic. In the multipolar gauge, it's super ohmic cubic. Um, but more generally, we could have any complex function of mode frequencies and atomic frequencies and coupling strengths and space and time. It's an extremely general freedom. Um, so, so we can, each different one is, is specifying the atom as a different physical object. And, and one of the, the interesting um, choices that we've discovered so far um, is, is one in which we can actually choose gauge whereby the atom is defined as being an object in which the virtual photons that are ordinarily dressing the bare atom in the ground state are absorbed into the definition of the atom. Um, and this, this choice of gauge is provided by some intermediate between the Coulomb gauge, so a certain level of electrostatic dressing. But importantly, um, this choice of gauge is not a constant function of the other model parameters. So, one of the defining features of a strong coupling like matter physics is this, this presence of these admixtures of virtual foot, uh, excitations in the ground state. Now, we might, as an answer to this question of what do we measure or what is system, uh, submit that what we measure are real excitations that are defined relative to the ground state of the overall composite. In which case, our most operationally relevant definition of what constitutes system is going to be given by some intermediate value of the gauge parameter that's a function of the um, uh, of the material frequencies, of the of the um, bath frequencies, and the coupling strength. 
And obviously, as we increase the coupling strength, these virtual processes become uh, more prominent. And so the atom becomes less, the atom that includes that virtual cloud becomes less localized. But crucially, if we define what we mean by system as that thing that includes those virtual photons, then what we mean by system certainly isn't uh, something that stays fixed as we vary the model parameters, right? We, we can't think of a uh, system if we define it operationally as being something that's fixed from the outset. We have a system and environment and then we can, and then we can investigate, for example, the thermodynamics of that. That's not the case. Actually, what we call system has to vary as uh, if, if, if we're adopting this sort of operational definition, what we call system has to vary as a function of the other model parameters. And in fact, the arbitrary gauge framework seems to give us a good sort of framework to start investigating how thermodynamics, for example, um, varies as a function of this freedom, as a function of what it is that we define to be system. So in gauge non-relativistic regimes, we can vary this, this freedom. And we would expect to find that the emergent thermodynamics is completely independent of that. But outside of such regimes, we would expect the emergent thermodynamics for the information and the energy exchange between our atom and our environment to vary quite significantly as a function of how we are defining system and environment. So in that sense, I think this, this sort of gauge relativity um, is, is fairly broad and, and could have it very implication, uh, interesting implications for thermodynamics. And we can we can look um, at how thermodynamics, for example, varies as a function of this, this freedom. Um, OK, so that's sort of the, the end of the first part of the talk. I wanted to introduce quantum subsystems uh, as being gauge relative and explain what that meant. I explained that, that really these different definitions, say, of matter or of system differ in their localization um, properties, so the extent to which they're localized versus dressed by virtual or electrostatic contributions. Uh, and this can only really be ignored in, in gauge non-relativistic regimes. So beyond that, there may be sort of some interesting things to look at for, say, for example, the emergent thermodynamics or the emergent uh, reduced open quantum system descriptions. So to exemplify that sort of importance or the utility of the concept, I want to now move on to, to a particular topic, which is the thermodynamic phases of um, cavity QED systems. So this is sort of this hotly debate debated topic that I mentioned at, at the beginning. So we can consider this situation for the second part of the talk in, in which we have a, a cavity, so some fabry perot cavity, say, with these parallel mirrors. And in, so this is a cavity. And inside it, we have lots and lots of um, atoms or dipoles. We can model these dipoles as just individual two-level systems. So each there are n dipoles labeled by an index mu. And each one has raising and lowering operators, plus and minus for the index i. And then we can define these collective operators, um, the j operators. Excuse me, I'm just going to have a drink. Thank you. Um, so these collective uh, raising and lowering operators for the, for the atomic systems. So our Hamiltonian, which is the Dickey Hamiltonian for the overall system, is, is a, a collection of two level systems and, and we can model the ca cavity standing wave as just one, one bosonic mode of radiation. And then we have a linear interaction between these two things with coupling strength G, where N is the number of dipoles. Okay, and this, this Dickey model, as it's called, um, it has some, some really interesting, um, well, properties in the macroscopic limit. So we can take the, the so-called thermodynamic limit where n goes to infinity and, and also so the number of dipoles is going to infinity and the volume of the cavity is going to infinity, uh, whereas the density stays stays constant in this limit. So I suppose for those of us who, who believe in the quantum thermodynamics or thermodynamics at the, at the microscopic scale would say this is a misnomer. It's really It's really the macroscopic limit that we're taking. And what it turns out happens in this in this macroscopic limit is that we can get a, a quantum phase transition in the ground state of the system. So beyond a certain coupling strength, uh, it, when, once we've taken this uh, thermodynamic limit, beyond a certain critical coupling strength, uh, a quantum phase transition occurs, and the macroscopic uh, and the occupation of the bosonic mode uh, in in the ground state. Um, uh, becomes macroscopic. So we call this a superradiant phase transition. So this is the well-known superradiant phase transition of, of the Dickey model. Uh, and it has been 
hotly debated for many decades uh, to and fro, people saying, yes, this is a genuine physical occurrence, other people saying, hang on a second, I don't think it is because it's not really a properly derived microscopic model that you've used. Other people saying, well, hang on a second, I think, yes, it is. And, and this goes backwards and forwards. So straight away after the, the phase transition was predicted, the guy said, well, if we add this A squared term, which should be there in, in a proper microscopic Coulomb gauge model to the Dickey model, then we find we get this renormalized Dickey model and its coupling strength G tilde and its its cavity frequency omega tilde are renormalized. Now, if we vary the original um, the original uh, coupling strength, we find that this renormalized coupling strength can never get over the value it would need to get over in order that the, the phase transition can actually occur. In other words, when we add this extra term in, we get a no-go theorem for the phase transition that was predicted to occur when we just had the Dickey model, uh, and so. This seems to say that actually we don't get a phase transition in the correct Coulomb gauge model. But of course, well, for those of us who are, are a little bit familiar with any of the models of light matter physics, we might know that this is, the appearance of this A squared term is very much a, a, a feature of the Coulomb gauge. It doesn't necessarily occur in other gauges, and in particular, it doesn't occur in the other most commonly chosen gauge of light matter physics, which is the multipolar gauge. Uh, there we just get back the original Dickey model, and that did allow a phase transition. So the story continues. We can also consider, well, what about if we add direct electrostatic interactions into the Dickey model? Well, then again, we seem to get back a no-go uh, theorem for the phase transition. Um, but we can also consider adding electrostatic interactions and an A-squared term. And you could say that this really is the correct Coulomb gauge model. Because as I mentioned, the Coulomb gauge is defined by its inclusion of electro electrostatic contributions in the material subsystem. So they should be explicitly present in the Coulomb gauge. So if we have this full Coulomb gauge model, then we it turns out that we can get back a phase transition like in the original Dickey model. But that the phase transition doesn't seem to be the same phase transition that's predicted by the Dickey model. It seems to be this ferroelectric phase transition. It's not super radiant. It doesn't give a macroscopic occupation of the bosonic mode. Uh, so the question is, what, what really is going on here? I mean, does a phase transition occur or does it not occur? If it does occur, what does it look like? Is it super radiant? Is it ferroelectric? Is it both? Is it neither? Um, it's, it's sort of an open question and, and it's been debate, debated a lot for, for a long time. So to exemplify this, I mean, we can look relatively recently. This, this paper is one of my favorite ones because it seems to be technically very on point, it's very astute, uh, and it seems to be certainly correct in what it says. And this is saying quite clearly that actually the Dickey model is adequate um, and a phase transition certainly can occur. This is relatively recent uh, PRA. Much more recently this last year and, and actually since in the last few weeks, I mean, there have been tons of, of uh, papers, preprints about this topic because it's, it's very interesting for for looking at condensed matter systems inside cavities. We have papers that also equally seem to be absolutely technically correct, but which are stating no, a, a, a phase transition can't, well, a super radiant phase transition, photon condensation can't occur. Uh, and these things would appear uh, at first glance to be to be contradictory. So so what what how can we try to resolve this paradox? So these are two examples, but I mean, there's a, there's a huge, uh, a massive amount of literature on this topic. So we're going to show that, well, we're hopefully, I'm going to convince you that with this concept, armed with this concept of, of subsystem gauge, re gauge relativity, we can, we can resolve this paradox. So first thing we have to do is derive our model. So we've got our model. We're going to, we're going to parameterize the choice of gauge using this parameter as, as I went through. And then we have to perform our approximations to get it down into the form of a Dickey model. So there are a few approximations. We, we're going to assume that the atoms are fixed and that they're electric dipoles. So they're, they're, they're small compared to the, the resonant wavelengths of radiation within the cavity. They're also closely spaced, so they all see essentially the same mode of the, of the field. There's obviously an interplay between these two, these two approximations. I mean, there's a balancing act here because they have to be close enough that they see the same field, but they have to be far enough away that they're viewed as separate individual dipoles, not sort of um, not molecules or something like that. So if we, if we impose this, approximation too strongly so we require that they're too close together then i mean the, the dipoles might enter a solid phase or something like that before they ever enter a super radium one so there's a balancing act between these these approximations but there is a window a finite window in which both should be valid and that's going to be the window that we're looking at 
Uh, and then the third approximation is this single mode approximation. This isn't really necessary. Um, it just simplifies the calculations a lot. But the important point is that if we're going to make this approximation, then we have to we have to make it carefully in, in a way that preserves the structure of the theory, so preserves the gauge invariants and the commutators and, and, and the kinematic relations of the theory. Um, in particular, it needs to preserve the unitarity of gauge fixing transformations to preserve gauge invariance. So we do that in such a way that, 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 that it, does, it does indeed have these properties and we get a much simpler theory. And then the final approximation to get something that looks like a Dickey model is, is the two-level approximation. Now this uh, unavoidably does break the gauge invariance of the theory. After we project down a part of the system, uh, we're no longer gonna, gonna get unitary gauge fixing transformations on the projected space. Um, but fortunately, this is not really gonna affect anything. We can certainly identify gauges in which this approximation is, is accurate. And uh, it'll turn out that the, the um, predictions that we're interested in are going to be gauge invariant anyway, despite this approximation. So we can certainly keep a track of the effect of this approximation. So those are our, our, our approximations, and, and they give this sort of applied, in, implied in the, in the fundamental Hamiltonian that we've derived from first principles, including the choice of gauge in this parameter alpha. When we perform these approximation, out we get is this sort of hefty Hamiltonian for the interaction between our collective operators and our cavity mode. And the subsystems, of course, are labeled by the gauge. The subsystems are defined relative to the choice of gauge. Also, because of the two-level approximation, the Hamiltonian itself is a different two-level approximation in each different gauge. So actually, the theory is not only gauge relative, it's no longer gauge invariant. But as I mentioned, it's easy for us to keep track of the breakdown of gauge invariance um, and make sure that it, it doesn't affect anything. So I won't go through this, but it's just a, this is the Hamiltonian that we can then use, and we can now probe the thermodynamic limit. And we do this using this holstein primakov map of SU2 onto the bosonic, uh, onto a CCR algebra, bosonic algebra. So we get this representation of the J operators in terms of the bosonic operators, and then we can take the thermodynamic limit. It's also a function of N. So we can probe the thermodynamic limit. And when we do that, what we get is a Hamiltonian in the thermodynamic limit. And this Hamiltonian describes what we're going to call the normal phase. So what it is, is a diagonalized Hamiltonian of, of polarotonic bosonic operators. So we have an upper polarotonic energy and a lower polarotonic energy, and then just a constant here. Uh, and, and this is the photon branch. This is the material branch. And what we can say is that this Hamiltonian is a valid description of the thermodynamic limit. Um, whenever this lower polarotonic energy is real, and it will break down when when that uh, that energy is no longer real, so it's no longer a Hermitian operator. And reality of the of the lower polaroton energy, it turns out um, we can derive for the reality this remarkably simple inequality. So it's it's very complicated. Um, one of those calculations that's very complicated, but then gives out a very simple result, which is quite quite satisfying. And we see that this this lower polariton energy is um, is real, provided this inequality is satisfied. So the material two level system uh, energy is greater than twice the density times the dipole moment squared for each two level system. So. This is a gauge invariant result, which is saying that a phase transition certainly does occur whenever this inequality is violated. So that's our first main result. We're, we're finding that a, a, a phase transition does occur, and it's a gauge invariant prediction that happens at this point in parameter space. Um, beyond the phase transition, so in the abnormal phase, um, we need to derive a different description of the system. We do that by displacing the material and the cavity bosonic operators by macroscopic quantities, so quantities that have um, that are of order of the number of dipoles. And then we take the thermodynamic limit, and we again get a polarotonic Hamiltonian with upper and lower polarotons. Uh, and we find that this Hamiltonian is valid precisely in the abnormal phase. So in other words, when the previous inequality was is violated, um, this Hamiltonian is valid. So this is the Hamiltonian that describes the abnormal phase. And at the phase transition point where this quantity is equal to this quantity, um, the two Hamiltonians are equal. So we've now got a Hamiltonian description of the entire um, thermodynamic limit. And we find that this phase transition into a new phase, a quantum phase transition does occur, and it occurs at this unique point in parameter space. So that's a gauge invariant prediction, and that's nice. The where where the gauge freedom starts to have an impact is when we consider what type of 
uh, phase transition is this? Is it is it a superradiant phase transition or, or what is it? Well, um, we can note that in the Coulomb gauge, the uh, cavity mode isn't displaced by a macroscopic amount. So for the Coulomb gauge, alpha equals zero, gamma zero equals zero. So the, the cavity mode isn't displaced. In other words, this phase transition, according to the Coulomb gauge, is a purely mater material phenomenon. It's purely ferroelectric. Whereas in any other gauge, it looks at least partially super radiant. It's, it's, it's a function of the material operators and the, the cavity operators. So the classification of this unique phase transition that occurs at this unique point in parameter space appears to be different depending on the gauge. But of course, we shouldn't really find this surprising because every gauge defines light and matter differently. So of course, they're going to give different classifications for a phase transition as being super radiant or not super radiant. So what we can say is that the, the unambiguously in the abnormal phase, this transverse polarization field has this macroscopic average where mu here is just a function of rho and d. And this is a gauge invariant prediction that is an un unambiguous manifestation of the abnormal phase. This has a macroscopic average in the abnormal phase. Similarly, this transverse electric field has no macroscopic average in the abnormal phase. And these two things are, are gauge invariant predictions. And they suffice to completely resolve the apparent paradox that we've been seeing. So in the Coulomb gauge, light is defined entirely in terms of the transverse electric field. And so it means that in the Coulomb gauge, the phase transition doesn't look super radiant. It looks purely material. In the multipolar gauge, for example, we saw that light was defined in terms of the transverse electric field and the, the longitudinal electric field, which is equal to this transverse polarization, polarization field everywhere outside of the atoms. So according to light as defined by the multipolar gauge, then the, the, the phase transition is super radiant. So in other words, is the phase transition super radiant? Well, it, the question is ill-posed unless you give an unambiguous definition of what's meant by radiant, and each gauge gives a different definition. We can say unambiguously as a precise mathematical statement, the phase transition isn't super radiant zero. We have to recognize that uh, quantum subsystems are gauge relative, and therefore the term super radiant, and in particular the term radiant, has to come with a subscript which determines the gauge relative to which light is being defined. Similarly, we can say that the phase transition is not super radiant subscript one. Now, of course, if we forget about the subsystems, if we forget about subsystem gauge relativity, then these two statements immediately are in contradiction. And this is what gives rise to the apparent paradox. But really, there's no paradox at all. These are perfectly compatible statements. And in fact, not only are they compatible, they're logically equivalent. So given that this is the macroscopic average of the transverse polarization, and this is the macroscopic average of the transverse electric field, if we assume that the phase transition isn't super radiant, it follows that the phase transition is super radiant one. Similarly, given this macroscopic average and this macroscopic average, if we assume this statement, this statement follows. So not only are they are they um, not contradictory, they're actually equivalent. It's telling us, sorry, it's telling us that, that the um, apparently paradoxical um, no-go and counter no-go results are not are not contradictory at all. The no-go results are making this statement that the phase transition is not super radiant, and the um, and the counter no-go results are making this statement that this phase transition is super radiant one. More generally, we can define the, the light subsystem relative to any gauge, and we can see that according to the definition of light made relative to the gauge alpha, the phase transition will appear super radiant proportional to alpha from this contribution here, um, alpha times this macroscopic contribution. If we say that uh, radiant is defined by some quadratic function of this, then it will go like alpha squared. So the degree to which the state, this unique gauge invariant phase transition is classed as super radiant or purely ferroelectric um, is directly proportional to alpha, the gauge relative to which uh, radiation is defined. So we see here that, that this recognition of this subsystem gauge relativity is sort of resolving this, this outstanding um, paradox. Of course, we can ask, is the, is the phase transition super radiant in an operational sense? Would you measure a macroscopic occupation of the cavity mode in, a, in an experiment? And as I tried to stress at the beginning, that really depends what your measurement uh, protocol and measurement devices are, how close they are to the, to the, uh, to the dipoles, um, what their time and length scales are, possibly how strongly they couple to the dipoles, or many different things. So 
we can't give a, a, an unambiguous statement about that independent of the, the measurement context that we that we plan on using. Um, but what we can and have shown is that there's no theoretical inconsistency and there's no fundamental uh, theoretical paradox. Actually, um, these these apparently contradictory statements are not contradictory at all. They're, they're equivalent. Um, and I think to finish off, I just had a few graphs to show the uniqueness of the phase transition point. So this is a plot of the lower polariton energy in different gauges. It's different in different gauges because of the two level approximation. So each one of the models is giving us a different two level approximation to this energy. Um, so this is as a function of coupling strength, but we see that the phase transition prediction is unique and it's the same predicted by every two level approximation. Uh, and it occurs at this cusp here. It's the same for the for the uh, upper polariton energy. Uh, so, so crucially, this is a gauge and variable prediction. Uh, and we can show also that we can, um, although the two level approximation does break the gauge and variance of the theory, we can certainly identify gauges in which it's a very good approximation. So, for finite number of dipoles, I'm pl plotting here the first transition energy of the of the system. Uh, according to the two level approximation. So this is given by the solid lines for n equals one up to eight dipoles. And then the green dots give us the, the prediction of the exact non-truncated theory. And we see that it's really a very good approximation, this two level approximation, provided we make it in the right gauge, it's a very good approximation. Um, and actually the approximation gets better as we increase the number of dipoles. So this two level approximation, yeah, it, it breaks gauge invariance, but it's, it's fine, it's not a big deal. Um, and we can also see this in the context of the uh, second derivative of the ground state energy, which also has this, this advantage of showing a gear precursor to the phase transition. So in the thermodynamic limit, we see this discontinuity at the phase transition point in this, uh, this, this rate of change because it's a second order phase transition. So, but uh, uh, for finite dipoles, we see precursor to this in the variation of, the, of, the, of this quantity. And again, we see that when performed in the right gauge, uh, this, this two level approximation is, is very accurate and it gets increasingly accurate as the number of dipoles uh, increases. Okay, so I think that's the end now also of part two. So my aim has been to show how this uh, subsystem gauge relativity concept that I introduced in, um, in the first part of the talk can sort of be useful in resolving this outstanding sort of critical issue in, in, in the thermodynamic phases of cavity QED. Um, we shown that we get a unique phase transition point. We've shown that the gauge invariant transverse polarization and the gauge invariant transverse electric field have unique um, averages. Um, and that this, these predictions are sufficient to resolve uh, all of the paradoxes um, in conjunction with recognition of the relativity of the subsystems. Uh, the two level approximation does break the gauge invariance of the theory, but it's, it's fine. We can show that it is a good approximation when made in, in the right gauges. Uh, so that's the end of the talk. I should thank um, the people uh, who have discussed this thing with a lot. So obviously, S and Nizia, who I've done the work with, but also um, Zach, who's a postdoc at Manchester. Ricardo, who I think is still at Queen's, uh, also a postdoc, uh, uh, is really an expert on these phase transitions and, and provides lots of literature. Actually, at the same time, I should definitely thank Mark Mitchison as well, because he I discussed this with him a lot. And also uh, uh, Peter Rabble um, at the University. Technology in Vienna, uh, my understanding has been informed quite a lot through through exchanges with him. So I should thank those people and uh, thank you for your attention. And, and that's everything. Thanks very much, Adam. Uh, really interesting. Um, so, yeah, so we have plenty of time for questions, guys. So don't be shy. Um, if you do have any questions, just um, just feel free to write them in the YouTube chat window. Um, but there's a bit of a delay, so it might take a little while for questions to come in. Um, oh, and also my iPad seems to have frozen, so let me just reload that. But um, okay, in the meantime, um, I can ask a couple of questions just to kick things off. So, I mean, I, I think I might have actually. Um, uh, ah, okay. So we actually we already have a question here. So maybe I can I can I can first go to the audience questions before I indulge myself. So um, so we have a question. The first question was from. Um, from Fabio Mendes Cordoba, um, who says, thanks a lot for the great talk. I want to know if these results were obtained with the addition of the no of the nonlinear terms. Uh, which which nonlinear terms? Yeah, I guess that might need a little bit of a clarification there, um, Fabio. So do you mean the nonlinear terms that one gets um, 
for, do you mean kind of a finite um, finite size terms or do you mean something else? So maybe we can wait for him to, to clarify that um, that question. Um, in the meantime, I'll move on to a question from Susanna Welga, uh, who says, um, so how would, how would, um, how would, so how would the presence of initial correlations uh, have an effect on, on defining subsystem gauge invariants? Uh, well, well, one one thing first to note is that uh, that every every definition of the subsystem is gauge invariant, right? They're all physical and gauge invariant definitions. They're just different uh, physical definitions. Um, and indeed, the the unitary gauge fixing transformations are non-local. So from if in 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 a certain gauge we've defined our subsystems and we assume a state in which they're uncorrelated, then the same physical state represented in terms of this, the, the bare states of a different gauge, so in terms of the eigenstates of different physical subsystems, um, is going to look correlated, it's going to look entangled. Um, so as an approximation, assuming an uncorrelated state in, in the presence of interactions, um, the, 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 the extent to which that is a justifiable approximation will depend on how we've defined our subsystems on, on the gauge relative to which we've defined it. And we sh I suppose if we if we want to make that approximation, we should find a, um, a, a gauge in which it's well justified, so in which the definition of the subsystems is such that the physical state we have is indeed an uncorrelated state with respect to those um, subsystems. But certainly different gauges in a in a given um, in a given state, um, different gauges will predict completely different um, levels of correlation in that state because different gauges are define the subsystems differently. So correlation entanglement is very much a gauge relative concept. It can only be defined relative to a decomposition of the system in the subsystems, and that's going to be different in every given gauge. So I'm not sure if that answers the question, but I I, I think that's probably the best I can. No, that, that, that's very interesting. I mean, maybe I can just follow up because uh, so then I wonder if you could actually use that as some kind of a criterion for for choosing the gauge. I mean, finding the gauge in which the, the correlations between your two systems are, Absolutely. are smallest in some initial even, state. Yeah, uh, and I even did actually discuss one. So this this representation we found in which the virtual photons in the ground state of the system are eliminated, they're absorbed into the definition of the atom. That also means that there's no correlations with respect to those subsystems in the ground state. So the bare ground state in which there are no photons and no atomic excitations is the true ground state of the system. The ground state is uncorrelated with respect to the subsystems defined by that particular gauge. In other words, if we define system as that thing, which um, if we define what we measure as being a, a system and what we measure as being only real excitations made relative to the true ground state of the overall system, um, then according to that definition of system, there are no correlations in the ground state. So in a sense, we are using that criteria as a, as a, as a means by which to define what we mean by system. That criteria co coincides with the criteria of having no, no virtual photons in the ground state. So. OK, thanks. That's really interesting. Um, all right. So, um, so yeah, so Fabio, uh, so Fabio clarified. So yeah, so Fabio, um, he, Fabio Mendes Cordoba, he said he, he's talking about the nonlinear terms that kill super radiants in the no-go theorem. Did you include them for your gauge analysis? So that's his I'm, A squared I'm term, sure. right? I'm not sure I know about that. Um, it could be that they, they mean the, um, the direct electrostatic interaction, I suppose they could be classed as non-linear terms, uh, which and those those interactions are present whenever the electrostatic interaction isn't explicit, um, which is in any gauge other than the multipolar gauge to some extent, there will be explicit electrostatic interactions um, unless, unless the longitudinal electric field is included entirely within the field subsystem. So if that is what we mean by nonlinear terms, then the answer is yes, we did include those. And actually, they're very important. They're absolutely uh, essential to showing that the phase transition prediction is a gauge invariant one and that it does occur in every gauge. Without those, then the Coulomb gauge wouldn't predict a phase transition. Um, and that would be an incorrect result. We, we need to include those, those because they are necessarily present in the Coulomb gauge. So but depending on what's meant by nonlinear terms, I think the answer is yes. But if, if another 
I know the definition of those terms is meant, then uh, then no, I don't think I did include them, but I, I don't know what they are. So I think he's talking about the A squared term, right? So that, that, that the is A squared term, certainly we did include that where the um, where in those gauges in which it appears, which is again in every gauge other than the multipolar gauge. Yeah, it's it's there, it's there. Uh, but uh, but it doesn't prohibit a phase transition, um, and the reason being that it prohibits a phase transition only when it's there, but we ha we don't include the electrostatic interactions, except that's not a that's not a microscopically correct Hamiltonian. Whenever there is an A squared term, there must also be um, electrostatic interactions, because what is definitive of the gauge in which there is an A squared term is that it also has electrostatic interactions. The Coulomb gauge, which has the A squared term, uh, includes the longitudinal degrees of freedom explicitly within the material subsystem. So there must all be electrostatic interactions within that gauge. And while the A squared term prohibits, without those uh, electrostatic interactions, prohibits a phase transition, when you include the electrostatic interaction, you see that a phase transition is allowed, uh, but it's just purely a ferroelectric one. So the Coulomb gauge classes the phase transition is purely ferroelectric. Uh, arising entirely from these electrostatic interactions. Any other gauge includes those degrees of freedom to some extent in the radiative subsystem. So according to any other gauge, the same phase transition looks super radiant. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, so hopefully that, that answers the question. Um, so feel free to keep asking questions, guys. We have lots of people sort of clapping and, and saying thanks. Um, so I think uh, well, maybe we wait for another question, but I can ask something that I, I mean, I think I asked you this last time I saw you give the talk, but I mean, I either can't remember the, the answer to the question or I just want to hear it again. But I mean, so basically, um, I mean, somehow, okay, so I get the idea that, that what you call, um, so that whether it's super radiant or not depends on the, on the gauge, but surely, I mean, operationally, and this is getting back to, to issues you've already mentioned, but operationally, I would have thought, I mean, my, my phase transition is super radiant if I stick a photo detector I, I make sure that my one of my cavity mirrors is a little bit leaky. I put a photo detector outside of the cavity mirror and I see for some set of control parameters that the light coming out of the cavity is enormously enhanced with near Poissonian counting statistics. So, I mean, does that, what does that mean? Does that mean then, I mean, first of all, would you agree with what I'm saying? And second, does that mean then that you can tell me what exactly the, the photo detector is measuring? Is it really the photo detector is measuring the transverse electric field I mean and is that actually known in quantum optics maybe it is uh, so yeah uh, really really good question it's a nail on the head I mean these are the open questions um so there are many points uh, regarding that uh, firstly it's quite hard to to provide a, a truly microscopic uh, description of cavity leakage um because we have these walls and and it's quite a quite a formidable technical task to really do that in such a way that's really microscopically well motivated and which in which we can start to probe that question with with a, a fundamental model in which we've which we've expressed in an arbitrary gauge um one thing to say is that that um we well the transverse electric field coincides with the total electric field in in the radiation zone as it's called in the far field so far enough away from the dipoles we'd expect again to be in essentially a gauge non relativistic regime um i see so we would expect um that in order to to probe whether or not the phase transition can be classed as super radiant we'd need a, a measurement that's pretty close to the dipoles maybe some protocol for detecting inside the cavity or something like that. Um, but again, then as I, as I mentioned, this will may could depend on, on a lot of things. So the, the time and length scales, that measurement, how close they are to the systems, what the coupling strength is between the systems and, and the measurement apparatus. Um, but absolutely, in principle, this is uh, this is something that can be proved um, experimentally. What we can use an experiment to determine what the most operationally relevant theoretical definition of the subsystems is in any given experimental context. Um, so absolutely putting a photo detector there and trying to probe it experimentally um, is, is a reasonable uh, thing to do. Um, but I don't have a, a definite answer as to what, based purely on the theory, might happen in, in what is a quite a difficult experimental situation to start to model and to start to work out what would happen uh, within um, one final point to make might be that uh, 
a kind of appealing to experiment is one thing that we could appeal to, but we might be able to appeal to to other things purely within the theory. So other arguments, things like locality and causality, or, or things like thermodynamics. So thermodynamics ultimately puts constraints on um, the ways in which physical systems can interact. I mean, those those interactions have to obey the laws of thermodynamics, and so we might we might postulate that the meaningful or relevant definition of system and environment is whatever one is such that we can write down meaningful laws of thermodynamics, for example. Um, so that might be another way to try to, to try to work out what the most operationally relevant definition of these systems are, and then whether or not this, this physical phenomenon of the phase transition is super radiant with respect to the, to the relevant definitions that we've identified. Okay, thanks. Um... Okay, so yeah, we have, okay, so Fabio, I mean, Fabio Mendes Cordoba, I, I, I mean, he basically asked, so what, what, what would I measure in an experiment? So I'm, I'm guessing, I hope that, that Adam's answer to my question also answered your question, um, Fabio. Um, so um, we have another question from, from Lucas uh, Celeri, who says, um, thanks for the great talk. Um, from what I got, the problem of losing gauge invariance is the finite size approximation for the atoms. Do you have some physical intuition regarding why this happens? Is this related with the breakdown of some symmetry due to the approximation? Uh, well, I'm 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 glad that question was asked because um, the the thing that is possibly the most important take home message of my talk is that there is no breakdown of gauge invariance. Um, every the theory is is fundamentally gauge invariant up to the point that we make the two level approximation. But as I try to convey. Um, uh, that's really not a problem. So um, let's imagine we didn't make that approximation. The theory is gauge invariant, but it still fundamentally is gauge relative. So the fact that these different gauges are predicting or classifying the, the phase transition in different ways is not a breakdown of gauge invariance at all. Um, it's the, 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 the physical predictions for any given physical observable are the same in every gauge. They're classed, the, 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 the phenomenon is classed as looking different because the physical degrees of freedom that we're using to define what we mean by light and what we mean by matter are different in different gauges, but that's a form of relativity, not a form of non-invariance. So there is no breakdown of gauge invariance, um, and everything that I've talked about is not in any way an artifact of approximations or, or simplifications. It's very much a fundamental feature of quantum molecular dynamics which is a direct result of the existence of, of electric charge, of the existence of the constraint. Uh, and we have a freedom to place these constraint degrees of freedom in, in diff into different subsystems. And that's why classifications of the unique physical phenomena in terms of different physical subsystems are going to be different classifications. But the theory is gauge invariant, and none of these different classifications are in contradiction. They're all equivalent. So uh, I think the answer is, is no, there is no breakdown of age invariance and, and as a result that it can't possibly be a, a result of any approximation or anything like that. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, so unless we have any kind of quick further questions, um, then I think that's probably a good moment to conclude. Um, so so we'll have another talk so the final talk of uh the series before we have a break for for well, for my holiday in august is going to be on friday so so i'm going to give a talk i think hosted by john um but yeah so there'll be more news about that but um in the meantime thanks everyone uh for joining us of course and thank you so much uh dr adam stokes for a super interesting talk cheers <laughs>